a snack and get comfortable or throw me on in the background while you clean your space. Do what you need to do, but we're about to talk about the election and upcoming changes plus recent COVID updates. It's one of the few times in my life that I've been happy about being wrong. I thought Trump was going to win. The 70 million plus votes he acquired is proof that I had legitimate reason for my prediction. This year, Trump won a larger share of the non-white vote than any Republican since 1960, and more votes period than any Republican in history. But thanks to back-breaking organizing by black women like Stacey Abrams and Nikki Robinson, and indigenous groups in Wisconsin, Arizona, and Montana, over 75 million people decided to vote out the orange bastard in chief, whether or not they're actually supportive of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. So what else happened during this historic election? Let's dive in. Voters approved legalizing recreational weed everywhere it was on the ballot, meaning smokers in Arizona, Montana, New Jersey, and South Dakota can rejoice. Hopefully all of the celebrities and influencers who tweeted their excitement about this news will spread the campaigns of grassroots organizers working to free people incarcerated for marijuana offenses. This is especially important now that 33.8% of the population, or 111 million Americans, live in states where weed is legal. Oregon voted to decriminalize personal possession of hard drugs like meth, cocaine, and heroin. This is a massive step forward in drug decriminalization and decarceration efforts. The same way it seemed radical and random when states began decriminalizing weed in the 70s, and when California legalized medical weed in 1996, Oregon's news shocked a few people and the resulting timeline drags were epic. While decriminalization of all drugs will certainly become more mainstream, the racial stereotypes associated with drugs, especially in conservative parts of the country, means a continuing slow uphill battle. They're still dragging their feet on regular chronic, though this year's approval of medical marijuana in Mississippi is a sign of definite change. Parolees got the right to vote in California. Colorado voted to establish a program for paid medical and family leave. Florida voted to increase the minimum wage to $15 by 2026, though by that time, cost of living will again have risen. Nebraska repealed language that allowed slavery or involuntary servitude as a legal punishment for crime. They also established gambling at licensed racetracks. The king of gambling, Nevada, voted to require utilities to get 50% of their electricity from from renewable resources by 2030. One of my favorite bits of good news is that Washington State voted to approve Referendum 90, which requires public schools to provide comprehensive sex education. Be sure to check out Let's Talk About Sex History for more information on why comprehensive sex ed is such a big deal. Welcome to the stage, Miss Emma. Quick letter, quick letter, ah. Quick, quick, letter, ah. Hump back, hump back, ah, 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 ah. In Mississippi, the state with the largest proportion of black residents, a black candidate has never been elected to statewide office. Mississippi was the only state to not provide all citizens with the option to vote early. Only people who were over 65 years old, those who were away from their home area on election day, and people with disabilities were allowed to vote early, either in person or by mail. Even still, voters gathered and toiled in long lines to pass Ballot Measure 2, which removed an old Jim Crow era electoral vote process. Under the previous law, statewide offices were voted on by the public, but then decided by the Mississippi House if no candidate got a majority popular and electoral vote. Simply having a popular vote is a game changer for Mississippi politics, and it's what we need on the national level. Mississippi also replaced their shitty flag with 70% of voters approving the new design. This is wildly good news when considering that the governor, Tate Reeves, who just 
began serving this year, declared April as Confederate Heritage Month. Polls from that month even showed that half the state didn't want to change the flag. But various murders committed by police, along with the George Floyd protests and resulting monument removals, increased interest in changing the flag. Several Mississippi groups, including Black Lives Matter activists, Baptist ministers, and business-minded conservatives, have been pushing the change. That last group was especially motivated when both the SEC and NCAA made anti-Confederate flag stances. The NCAA even said it would no longer hold major competitions in Mississippi if the flag didn't change, representing the financial repercussions of keeping the racist symbol. While I'm happy for the countless black Mississippians who don't have to officially live under that flag anymore, it's bittersweet because it took too long for this to happen. Also, what does this symbolic gesture ultimately mean at the end of the day when Mississippi continues to suffer from miserable poverty, collapsing bridges, horrid prisons, poor health care services, and more. You won't catch those business-minded conservatives standing up to fight those battles. The last of the good news I'll mention today, though it is bittersweet, is that Puerto Ricans voted in a referendum for statehood, with 52% of voters approving the measure. However, it has no direct effect on Congress, though it does show that a growing portion of the mistreated and colonized territory rightfully wants full citizenship rights, like representation in Congress. The resident commissioner, Jennifer Gonzalez, says she is taking the referendum results to Congress. She serves as Puerto Rico's sole representative and is a Republican. California voters approved Proposition 22, which allows gig economy companies like Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash to continue treating workers like independent contractors. Those three companies actually designed the measure so that they wouldn't have to employ drivers and provide valuable benefits. They spent over $200 million on their campaign and threatened to move their headquarters from California if Prop 22 failed. As Americans increasingly rely on gig labor and not just in California, this this victory demonstrates how these companies and others will skirt labor laws and create their own across the country. I don't pay you to breathe. You hardly pay us at all. And if you watch Lectual Does the 70s, you're thinking about how many companies abandoned the North in union labor so they could find cheap non-unionized labor in the South in the 70s. This changed regional economies and impacted migration and politics, and we might see a 21st century version of that as the gig economy grows, or at least we'll see more of these companies threatening the states they live in. One of Biden's campaign promises, by the way, is to go after companies that misclassify workers as independent contractors. I would like to see it. But we'll see. California voters also notably rejected Propositions 18, 22, and 25. Prop 18 would have allowed 17-year-olds who would be 18 at the time of the next general election to vote in primaries and special elections. Prop 22 would have given local governments the ability to enact rent control. Prop 25 would have replaced cash bail with risk assessments for suspects awaiting trial. These would have been some great progressive changes. California is a notorious blue state, and this shows how that doesn't translate to people voting for radical policies. Louisiana voted to state that there is no right to abortion or abortion funding in the state constitution. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! A 25-year-old white man named Madison Cawthorn won a very conservative area, North Carolina's 11th congressional district. He is best known for dropping out of school before fulfilling a political science degree and creating a website that denounced a white man who worked for, quote, non-white males like Cory Booker, who aims to ruin white males running for office. His acceptance tweet said, cry more, Lib. I'd just like to say that Madison Cawthorn might quite possibly be the whitest name I've ever heard, not even second to Tom Cotton or Fitch Bradley. Lauren Boebert, a QAnon conspiracy theorist, was elected to Colorado's third congressional district. In addition to the usual Republican hoopla, anti-abortion, anti-gun control, anti-Green New Deal, she wants the United States Department of Education to be eliminated. So speaking of the House, Democrats now hold the smallest majority of the House of Representatives in 18 years, which will limit Nancy Pelosi's power and when coupled with a potential Republican
Republican Senate majority could mean a lot more fruitless congressional sessions where nothing gets done. But there's more bad news to speak of. A three-hour leaked phone call from November 5th between House Democrats exposed the ideological chasm occurring within the party. And Republicans are already seeking to exploit this ideological chasm. Progressive Democrats like Michigan's Rashida Tlaib, Massachusetts' Ayanna Presley, and New York's Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez insist that if the party doesn't provide more tangible and radical positive benefits, people will leave the party. Exit polls and social media diatribes back this up. Progressive caucus members have had some of the highest turnout in urban areas in recent years, mainly because of anti-Trump sentiments, but this isn't the case everywhere. Moderate Democrats like Virginia's Abigail Spanberger and Oregon's Kurt Schrader insist that ill-branded leftist ideology is scaring their centrist constituents in conservative areas into leaving the party. If you haven't seen How to Be Black, a video where I break down the black American population through religion, region, and more, please watch. It's great for explaining black political differences, but also makes you think about American demographics as a whole. For example, a lifelong registered Democrat living in the Bible Belt will have a vastly different worldview from a sometime Democrat voter living in New York City. They may share some similar views, but which one will be the reliable voter, with demands least troublesome to the status quo? Both threaten to abandon Democrats if their biggest concern is ignored or implemented, but which one will actually make the leap to the opposing side? In other words, which groups will Democrats be courting fiercely, and how do they deal with Republicans coming in to take whoever gets neglected? This is the battle we will see playing out during these crucial next four years, and you can't fault people for seeing the whole thing as redundant. If you follow me on Twitter or engage with a lot of my content, you know I spend a lot of time critiquing America's history of crappy education systems and anti-socialism propaganda along with our religious fanaticism. Please don't forget these things in any analysis of why people vote the way they do. Simply blaming people's rejection on the left on racism, though it is a huge factor, is a dangerous mistake that ignores reality like a larger portion of black people voting for Trump this year than they did in 2016. It's time to stop! Democrats have a chance to control two out of three branches of government if Georgia's January runoff election gets Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff to the Senate. By the way, the runoff rule was created in the early 1960s by Georgia Dixiecrats to disadvantage black voters when the Supreme Court rejected Georgia's former electoral system. Anyways, this outdated rule, born of racism, is crucial to Biden making good on certain campaign promises, but doesn't guarantee anything because several Democrats are centrist and moderate and willing to reach across the aisle, including Biden. However, 34 Senate seats will be up for election in 2022, meaning it is imperative that people keep pressure on the most moderate senators for the next two years and constantly threaten them with more progressive replacements. But even as I say this, I have to remind myself that most Democrat voters, at least the ones who vote regularly, are not for progressive measures like defunding the police or ending fracking. And it kind of falls on leftists to outmaneuver slander and do better branding and educating so more people support these issues since many people are indoctrinated to run screaming from these ideas. This brings me to the ugly. So yeah, I mentioned that over 70 million people voted for Trump, right? He won less than 63 million in the 2016 election. Despite four years of lies, meltdowns, racism, attacking the press, mobilizing vigilantes, and fumbling a goddamn pandemic response, seven more million people than last time decided to vote for Donald Trump. While people can celebrate the successful push to vote Trump out, we can't ignore that America's fragile and inadequate democracy is still on life support. For the next four years, conservatives will continue to alter language, inventing new phrases similar to fake news and illegal vote. They'll find Find someone more charming than Trump to push the same bullshit. Someone who people don't have to feel too embarrassed about supporting. Someone who doesn't use mostly adverbs when speaking. Bigly. Someone who can sound like a likable outsider politician, not a polarizing greasy scumbag. Just like they did for this election, Republicans will spend millions of dollars to tie Democrats to calls to defund the police without explaining what that statement even means, even though most Democrat politicians avoid supporting the idea. 
Conservatives will continue pumping out propaganda to distort the messages of police prison abolitionists and police defunding groups so that Biden and other Democrats will have sister soldier moments to denounce such people as extremists, alienating a bunch of people who voted for them, but not the majority. You've reached 911. I'm sorry that there is no one here to answer your emergency call, but leave a message and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. Conservatives will up their anti-abortion and anti-climate change rhetoric, while Trump-appointed judges keep to the party agenda. There will be an increased sex trafficking panic via potent QAnon conspiracy theories, and big tech and mainstream media will be targeted with propaganda that they are anti-conservative and can't be trusted. It'll be on the social media platforms themselves to fold or stand against such pressure. Facebook, I'm looking at you with all those conspiracy ads. A lot of propaganda will flow into Latino communities whose large turnout for Trump this year showed that they are a viable voting bloc. Evangelical Christians will be a great entry point for such Republicans in waiting. The Associated Press said that Joe Biden is president. Ha! <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Disgusting. Yeah. Uh -huh. Also, conservatives will continue to find sneaky ways to suppress votes, not just in 2024, but 2022 as well, when the House and 34 Senate seats are up for re-election. It'll be especially interesting to see how many Democratic candidates will be facing primary challenges from younger progressives. Throughout all of this, it'll be the Democrats' responsibility to keep the 75 million people who turned out for Biden engaged. However, because most of those people were voting out of desperation rather than active hope and enthusiasm, that'll be a tough task. If the 2024 candidate is the better, shinier, less embarrassing Trump that I think he will be, creating an opposition vote will not seem as important as it did this year. So Democrats must actively court these voters with tangible benefits while also battling four years of sneaky conservative tactics to grow their own 70 million turnout into a formidable opposition. Whenever Democrats do something inclusive or progressive, prepare for the right wing to usher in a voter who is racist, misogynistic, classist, homophobic, etc. with welcome arms. Also, we can't forget all the financial conservatives who only vote about taxes usually, but who still demand social services. They are hypocrites of the highest order and will be back voting the Republican ticket now that Trump is gone. Trumpism, aka fascism or populism in other countries, did not start or end with Trump. Yes, Trump is emblematic of America's love affair with white supremacy and the filthy rich, but his leadership style is a fusion of other fascist leadership happening worldwide. This includes criminalizing dissent, suppressing and demonizing the media, dehumanizing and harassing opposition, and skirting slash ignoring the law. This is happening in Brazil, Turkey, the UK, and more. New developments in technology and increased climate migration will only further drive populist sentiments. Trumpism in this year's election are just one component of this continuing battle. And here's where you may be asking, what battle, Lexi? The battle to dismantle the world as we know it and eradicate exploitative capitalism across the world? Or the battle to dismantle the world as we know it and revert back to the racism, misogyny, class inequality, and homophobia of yesteryear? I'm talking about the second one. 70 million Americans and their snot-nosed, impressionable kids who can't vote yet are telling you that the second one is happening right now. As for what Biden plans to do during his presidency, the best I'm expecting is him undoing the shit Trump did in an attempt to undo the Obama administration's changes. Basically, he'll be turning things down from it's hot as hell in here to hell is rather hot, isn't it? Meaning that shit will suck less and things will be calmer, but there will not be much, if any, radical change. America's foreign politics, as well as sanctioned violence and an unwavering commitment to capitalism, will continue. That's the reality many I know are grappling with while they watch in stunned anger as hella people celebrate another neoliberal's ascent to the presidency. Not to mention people's disgust with electoral politics in general, especially after the year we've had COVID, protests, anger, and what seemed to be an incipient revolution with so much blood spilled over the summer. But this is where we are. 
Feel free to drop your coping mechanism for this unfortunately grim reality in the comments. But don't be too sad. Without congressional approval, Biden can rejoin the World Health Organization, restore over 125 environmental rules that Trump reversed or weakened, stop drilling for oil and gas on public land, reassure foreign allies that America is committed to fighting climate change, etc. Like I said, he can undo Trump's bullshit, install the right wing's long-term plans to take this country back to the 1950s. He can be swift with his executive powers and ignore conservative politicians and pundits when they claim he's doing too much. For example, he said he's going to reinstate Obama-era guidelines that restores transgender students' access to sports and bathrooms that align with their gender identity. Get on it! There's currently talk about Biden forgiving student loans, and this would go over extremely well. Again, get on it! If he can get congressional approval, he can abolish the filibuster, though he will not attempt to end the electoral college. And he wants to raise minimum wage to $15 an hour and provide paid maternity leave. Biden also plans to establish a team in his cabinet to strengthen union membership and prohibit laws that restrict them. All in all, this is a much better outcome than another four years of Trump. At least it appears that way in the short term. Again, this is a long game, and Republicans are great at long games seeing as they have been reshaping politics since the 60s. So what will I be stewing over for the next few years? Beyond the changes to my daily life as a black woman if the conservative majority Supreme Court decides to be jackasses, and beyond falling into a defeatist cocoon of none of this shit matters, here's what you can simmer on while your timelines fall back into leisure, luxury, and experts who don't read. If someone on the Supreme Court dies, will Biden appoint a moderate or a progressive? Will he reach across the aisle for his cabinet? Can the 2022 election lead to more progressive Democrats who champion abolishing the Electoral College? How will Republicans continue to exploit hateful attitudes and people's aversions to facts while the rest of us live in reality? How will Americans on all parts of the spectrum fall deeper into stan culture when it comes to politicians, and what do we do about it? How do we pull people back to the left instead of pushing them away as lost causes to the right? How can we get people to admit to the importance of branding to weaken Republican narratives about destroying class inequality? How will we teach and learn about those class inequalities so people actually prioritize them? How will the pandemic continue to impact geopolitics? How will additional unseen global issues like a pandemic impact our domestic politics? When are the next environmental disasters? disasters. How will new migration trends factor into all of this? Also, who will be the 2024 candidate that Democrats must face and defeat so that any benefits gained over this next four years don't get undone? Will more of those 75 million people turn to local elections before the next presidential election? Lastly, there's an ideological battle happening among Democrats that will only grow as the years go by. The party continues to move left to the dismay of establishment Democrats. Will this bring enough constituents to defeat a conservative opposition, or will gradual slow movement to the left repel too many moderates who want to stay center and radical leftists who are tired of things happening so slowly? If this were a real classroom and I were a real teacher, I'd have you write an essay answering these questions. But this is a video and I'm satisfied if you just mull over them in your mind. Only time will tell the answers. Of course, of course, all of this means nothing if Trump refuses to leave the White House and we're plunged into a civil war because juiced up meatheads with very little to live for have access to military grade artillery, so. Proud well, boys, stand back and stand by. This is not a test. This is your emergency broadcast system announcing the commencement of the annual purge. I think I'm joking, but seriously, in the midst of all of this, what are you doing to help better your community and impact this country now that voting is over? It's time to use that anger. like years ago when I first brought up COVID-19 on this channel, but it wasn't even a whole year ago. While America tells the line between normal and the new normal, many of us seem to have made our peace with the pandemic or shoved it to the back of our minds. It's hard 
hard not to with the election and everything else, but COVID-19 still poses a threat. Worldwide infections have passed 49 million and there have been over 1.23 million deaths. 238,000 of those deaths have been on American soil. On November 4th, America hit 100,000 new infections in one day for the first time since the pandemic began, a record. On November 5th, America broke the previous day's record with 121,000 new infections. Some school districts are going back to virtual learning as a result. For example, in Virginia, Henry County Public Schools allowed 22 staff and students to test positive and have hundreds more quarantined before a unanimous school board vote brought back virtual learning until at least January. Older students with virtually unchecked freedom aren't fending any better than grade school students with over 250,000 COVID-19 cases reported on over 1,700 college campuses. Most were reported after the summer lull since students returned for the fall semester. Also, did you know that there are concerns that COVID-19 can mutate and transmit to humans and animals like mink? Denmark, one of the major exporters of mink with over 15 million mink on 1,000 farms, is about to slaughter millions of those mink because of concern that a mutation in the virus infected the animals and could compromise the effectiveness of a vaccine for humans. Experts warn that any species capable of infection, including dogs, cats, and mink, could become a quote, reservoir that allows the virus to reemerge at any time and infect people. But somehow I cannot see them slaughtering hella cats and dogs just for this same purpose. Mutations at the time are currently not more harmful than the human spread virus, but of course, the concern is that these strains could mutate into something more dangerous in the future. Before spiraling out over those possibilities, let's get back to the here and now. Dr. Deborah Burks, the White House COVID response coordinator, sent an internal memo warning that COVID-19 is going to enter a deadlier phase that demands a more aggressive approach. She, Fauci, and other experts are all trying to emphasize what many countries in Europe are already realizing. This winter is about to get bad. Many countries have been reporting infection upticks since fall began, and this second wave is leading to a lockdown in Europe. As of November 2nd, Europe surpassed United States in cases per capita. England is locking down for four weeks, though many observers have noted loopholes and claimed it's barely a lockdown. Greece is doing a three-week lockdown amid increasing pressures on Greek hospitals. France is under national lockdown because intensive care units around the country are nearing full capacity. Italy is locking down portions of the vulnerable northern and southern regions. In Germany, restaurants, bars, gyms, and theaters closed, and hotels can't host tourists. Meanwhile, China, who has barred foreign tourists and business travelers since late spring, but allowed foreign residents, said the number of imported COVID cases has grown 45% in October. So numerous Chinese embassies in Ethiopia, France, Italy, Britain, Belgium, and more have prohibited almost all travel to China except for Chinese nationals. Other countries restricting their citizens is a hint for Americans, but are most of us paying attention? I'd say no. U.S. employers added 638,000 jobs in October, most of them for food and drink establishments and retail because people are going out again, which could be threatened by a second wave and a lockdown. The current unemployment rate is down to 6.9%, by the way, from 7.9% in September. But before you go rejoicing, the number of long-term unemployed, aka those who have been without work for 27 plus weeks, grew from 2.4 million to 3.6 million in October. Analysts have noted that now more than ever, job losses are more likely to be permanent. So what needs to happen? At the time of me filming this right now, Biden is supposedly issuing a really aggressive COVID-19 plan, so that's happening. But also the problem that I'm seeing is that so many people are tired of being afraid of COVID and want to keep living the same way as before, even if it's not guaranteed to be safe. Think about those dining bubbles in New York, people relying on bullshit temperature checks before entering hookah lounges. Hookah isn't even good. Good. It's not good, like I hate it. But also people attending mass parties where everyone's masks all eventually come off. I am sorry for that personal bias that just permeated this video, but hookah is garbage.
These people have lasted through the shenanigans all year, and they're currently feeling invincible, covered by God, or plain old nihilistic. So how do we account for them this winter? Unless shit gets shut down, or you advocate for the policing of these people, nothing. Nothing on a national level between now and January will change much, though some local governments with more left-leaning leadership might lay down some tough rules. As for whether or not those rules will be bogged down by red tape is up for more speculation. For example, in New York, the governor and the mayor of New York City disagree on easing lockdown restrictions, with de Blasio believing that there will be a second wave. So what about further relief packages? Apparently, Congress might meet before 2020 ends to approve a second stimulus. And again, Biden is unrolling his current plan for COVID-19 relief that I don't get to talk about because it's happening while I'm filming this video. But that wouldn't even be implemented until at least January. But it might include a second stimulus check for up to $1,200 per adult. When you get past the possibility of more deaths and continuing poverty and think about lockdowns and continued social isolation, the winter carries an additional threat. In states where people experience especially dark and cold winters, citizens are especially prone to mental health issues. The winter is also accompanied by a rise in substance abuse issues, which experts are predicting to result in a rise in suicide and drug overdoses. These COVID and winter-related mental health issues will disproportionately impact Black and Hispanic people, older people, poor people, and healthcare workers. As for the mental health of the nation in general, a lot of us are dealing with longer periods of grief from losing loved ones, along with a variety of high-profile deaths. It's no wonder that three times more Americans than last year are reporting anxiety symptoms. The upcoming wave of COVID cases doesn't sound pleasant, and I hate feeling numb to the entire pandemic because it's still so dangerous and real. But I'll keep staying safe and I hope you guys do too. What are your thoughts on the next phases of the pandemic? What are your thoughts on the election and everything I said about shit that's about to happen? Leave me a comment below. Also be sure to like and subscribe. Also, my ghostwriter says thanks for watching. And it kind of falls on leftists to outmaneuver slander and do better branding and educating so more people support these issues since many people are indoctrinated to run screaming from these ideas. That part's when somebody's gonna instantly hit thumbs down because they're gonna be like, why the fuck do I have to teach? Why do I have to do better branding? Like, why do I have to explain things in an attractive way? Because humans suck. <laughs> They need good branding and pretty packaging. And the Republicans have fucking figured that out.